All right, you guys, we are still working through our fourth blessing, the call up. And I want to revisit a few things today so that we can appreciate Revelation chapter 9, 7 and 8. I'll read that. Then we'll open in a word of prayer and then we will commence with our meditation. We're so glad to have Miss Holloway and Mother Banks back. Yep, just glad that y'all made your way back home. God's been good to you, and uh, we are glad to have you back. Miss y'all, miss y'all. Brother Matt, glad to have you in the house, boy. All right, Revelation chapter 19, 7 and 8 says, Let us be glad and rejoice, give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true saints of God. Father, we thank you for your kindness to us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for eyes to see and ears to hear. We thank you for the call that we heard in our salvation. We thank you for the call out that we continue to hear in our sanctification. We thank you for the call unto that brings us into union with Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the call that shall come one day for us to be called up into permanent presence and abiding with you and with your son and with your spirit and with the holy angels and with the saints of the living God in perfection and bliss for all eternity. We ask, Lord, that as we contemplate this today and as we do whenever we sit under your word, that it would be so real to us, so right to us, so true to us, that it would transform our thinking and affirm our citizenship as you have stated in your word our citizenship is in heaven from whence we look for our Savior who is coming one day uh, to change these vile bodies in order that they might be like unto his glorified spiritual body. We look forward to that, Lord, in order that we might engage in maximum praise and adoration for all that you are and all that you have done and all that you shall do on into the eternity of eternities with your people. We're asking for your mercy upon the whole body of Christ, healing across the land, healing throughout our nation, healing around the world, um, healing in all the dimensions in which we may be plagued, afflicted, troubled, traumatized, uh, hindered, impeded, Lord. You know where we are individually. You know where we are as families. You know where we are as local bodies of believers around the world. We're so glad, Lord, that you see everything. You're interested and you're, you have a disposition towards your people. You incline your ear to the cry of your saints. And that's why we call upon you, because we know and believe that you hear and answer prayer. And so we pray today, Lord, that you would open our eyes in the eyes of our heart, that we might lean into the promises a little bit more now. We come to you on the grounds of forgiveness, the forgiveness of sins that are in your son Jesus by his blood. We come to you on the grounds of his righteousness. The only way we can stand before you, our identity in him, by which we can cry, Abba, Father, we thank you again for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The operative term that we're looking at now in verse 8, as we have been already looking at the imperative in verse 7, to be glad and rejoice. What I tried to do with that, with that portion of the teaching is to kind of help you guys understand that coming into chapter 19, um, we are dealing with actually a ramping up, a ramping up of the enthusiasm of the people of God. You never want to forget that when you get into verse seven and eight and nine, and particularly verse nine, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb. You're dealing with a people who are at the height of enthusiasm, at the height of joy, at the height of jubilation, because they've come through a very long journey, a very long and arduous task for which the language is given to us 
in the latter part of verse 7, which I wanted to pick up from last week. Let us be glad and rejoice, give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. That's one propositional concept to deal with. And his wife hath made herself ready. That is the area that you and I want to work on today, because in her making herself ready, it says in verse 8, Therefore unto her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And what I wanted us to contemplate was the idea that that verse describing her being arrayed in fine linen is is a kind of consummation of the expectation that the people of God have for which they are they are inclined to go through what they go through in this world, endure what they endure in this world, because for them lies a prize that looks like a massive preparation and consummation of a wedding feast that takes place in a very public display of grandeur and splendor and and glory that we want to look at here in a moment but i want to take up that last line in verse seven and begin to work with you on the proposition uh she hath made herself ready half past tense made that is worked on it herself that's a reflexive verb herself she had made herself the word is what ready and the other translation is the word what prepared she is prepared she is prepared revelation chapter 21 verse 2 if you don't mind verse 1 start at verse 1 i'm going to show you the end before we go back here and talk about this preparation she hath made herself prepared, ready. We talked about this at length, but you are looking now in chapter 21 at the bride. You are looking at her in the language of the new Jerusalem, and you are looking at her in the terminology of the uh, nuptial engagement with her bridegroom, the Lord Jesus, and notice what it says. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So we have an eschatological indicator here that things have changed radically. In other words, God has now exercised what Peter said in Second Peter chapter 3, that the heavens will melt with a fervent heat, and all the elements therein will be burned up, and God will create a new heavens and a new earth. And does anyone know what that last line in Second Peter 3 says that's so important? Wherein dwells what? Righteousness. Wherein dwells righteousness? Again, the statement that I'm making is called a promise. Righteousness. And you're going to see how that plays itself out here in a moment. I think I better give that to you because it's not fair for me to quote the text and you not be familiar with it. Second Peter chapter 3, if you will, maybe start at verse um, 10. I think we might be in the ballpark with Second Peter 3. 10 and uh, we'll work through it. Second Peter chapter 3, 10. Yes, here it is. Now notice the language, saints. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. We already understand that imagery, don't we? For some, the day of the Lord is a dreadful, alarming, abrupt interruption in what they would consider a normalcy bias. This is what we're looking at in Revelation 18. Are we not Babylon? Babylon has fallen. In a moment, in one hour, in one day. That's the language here. He'll come as a thief in the night. But not for those who are awake. Not for those who are of the day. He plainly said, if you are his and you are operating out of your identity, he will not come as a thief for you. But apparently, and this is worthy of meditating upon, if Christ comes at a time in which as a thief, it's nighttime. What kind of nighttime are we talking about? Spiritual night. We're not talking about a physical 24 hour day distinction. We're not saying that Christ will come at seven o'clock in the evening or nine o'clock at night or 12 o'clock. He'll be coming when men and women are spiritually what? What's the word? Sleep. Sleep. We talked about that. 
That, that means you and I can think through what would be the kind of practical social implications of that time. They will be unaware of his return. They will be careless about it. They won't regard it. It won't mean anything to them. They won't be preparing for the Lord's return. He will therefore come upon them as a thief in the night. That gives the believer every reason to function in this world with a different attitude than the unbeliever. In fact, what you can do with the unbeliever is let them be an indicator for you as to how well awake you are. If, 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 you, if you will, and I, I've noticed this with myself, when I engage with the unbeliever for any period of time, and I mark how careless they are and the manner in which they may engage in and traverse into topics that either they know nothing about or they are radically presumptuous about. And in my mind, I go, they don't know. They're completely unaware of the presumption that they are indicating by what they're saying. They are totally unprepared for the possibility of God interrupting our world. And when I recognize that, I get an opportunity to say, but where am I in the disposition of my soul? Am I clear about the imminency of Christ's return? Am I understanding that it's very possible that none of us have such a handle on the chronological timetable of heaven that we can know exactly when Christ is coming? In fact, we know we can't know. And what we've been repeatedly talked about, told and warned about in this series, particularly in blessing number three, behold, I come as a thief in the night. If you do not watch, be careful that you do not find yourself naked. Don't let someone steal your garment. Remember, we said that only happens if you're asleep. Your garment can only be taken if you're asleep, i.e. Noah. Um, if you and I are in the right disposition, in the right framework, the right mindset as believers, then we can know the level of awokeness in the biblical sense that we're in by how clear we are about the level of unwokeness that the world is in. We can know, we can know that we are relatively healthy if we are not doing what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12 and the servant who said in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. He will not be back for a while. And then he begins to engage in what? Riotousness and drinking with the drunkards and, and engaging in abusing the servants of, of his master's household. He's functioning like the master's not coming. And we could easily argue that there would be many Christians who would be functioning that same way. We may have functioned that way as well. We may have drifted ourselves into patterns of carnality by which we have inadvertently or intentionally just left off with a sober mindedness about who we are in Christ, what time it is and whether or not Christ will come imminently. And when I use the term imminent, if you're not aware of what that means, it means that Christ can come on multiple levels. And we talked about this before. Ekoma is the Greek verb for him coming abroad. He can come in providence. He can come and shake up your life. He can come by uh, taking your job away. He can come by removing a very important person in your life and that jar you. He can come by allowing you and I to uh, experience a serious illness or sickness that lays us on our back and now all all of a sudden we're looking up when we should have been looking up earlier on, particularly within the framework of our blessing. He can come by our dying abruptly. There are many ways in which the Lord can come. He can come by the power of the preaching of the gospel where we come to church and we think we're awake, but that preaching actually becomes much more poignant on that day than it ever has. And the next thing you know, he has put his finger on an area of our lives where we have been deceitful and manipulative and self-deceived. And now all of a sudden we are shaking in our boots because that preaching now has shaken us up. That's how the spirit of God works when he comes. And uh, and in his mercy, he comes in those ways prior to coming either by death or the second coming. And so when we think about the coming of the Lord, we have to think about that in the context in which we have here, it says he'll come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements thereof shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works therein shall be burned up. Now we take this literally 
verse 10 because there are too many components in verse 10 for which if we took it any other way, we would creating we would create glaring contradictions. For instance, we do see the dichotomy of heaven and earth in that verse, don't we? But we also see the dichotomy of the heaven and earth in Genesis chapter one, verse one, two and three. Right. In the beginning, God created the what? Heavens and the earth. And we know in that context is talking about the first heavens and the earth in which we abide. Those are the heavens and the earth that Peter is saying that when God renews everything, they will go through a major conflagration. Back in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, the news that our nation and our world would contemplate and theologians would ponder was nuclear holocaust. That's the way they interpreted the text. If you look at the verse carefully again, the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. Nuclear Holocaust and the elements shall melt with fervent heat prior to the uh, splitting of the atom and the creation of the hydrogen bomb uh, going back five, six hundred, a thousand years. There was no way for mankind to really rationalize the world being destroyed in a global conflagration until we until science allowed us to be able to peer into the elements and split the atom. Once that occurred and we realized that we had tapped into energy sources beyond our imagination and now we can direct that energy source for good or evil. What do we do? We direct it towards evil. And now we know that with the arms race that took place between Russia and America and uh, China and, and, and the like, Pakistan, India, um, brother Max, shut that door back there. They should shut that door, please. We know that, um, we were in a precarious time in our history. I remember very vividly as a young teenager being in that time, hearing about the potential for the world being completely destroyed. And all of us were prepared who were older um, by having to get up under the table and practice drills. Do you remember how dumb that was? This brings us right back to how dumb it is today that our government would actually think that some of the stuff we're doing works. Now, what in the world is getting under a desk going to do when the bomb drops on you? Help me. Right. But we were all just fold your books really calm and just take your time and crawl under you. No, I'm running out the door. I'm going to find a better desk to hide under like God's desk a mountains or something. But remember, those kind of things were just they were so far fetched relative to the idea that the whole world could be consumed in a in a in a, uh, in a, a major nuclear war, which we still have the capacity to do, which we still have the capacity to do. And so the Bible is relevant in this sense. If God wanted to give mankind over to behavior patterns, where he takes his hand off of them. This is called reprobation of the nations in total. Um, he could give them over to a kind of uh, terminal warfare that they could destroy themselves. Couldn't he do that? Right. But if he should, according to his promise, the body of believers will have already been removed. That is a fundamental principle. It's not an escapism doctrine. It's just a fundamental principle. So he says here, uh, the earth also and the works there shall be burned up. Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved. There it is again. These grammar terms are extremely important in relationship to the deep, deep analysis that Peter is doing around this. Ought ye to be, how you, how ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God. Now notice line 12. What does it say? You and I should be looking for and hastening for the coming of God. This is an indicator of our spiritual health. This also is an indicator of our spiritual health. I know that I'm not spiritually healthy if I'm not looking forward to and longing. Hastening is a disposition of uh, uh, wanting it to actually be accomplished because there's something beyond that day that is so magnificent and marvelous that we would want to experience. Uh, worthy of meditation. Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire uh, shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. For the second time, Peter says it. Now look at verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to the what? promise and that's important so important the epi the promise the message 
around the message. The idea of the promise from the beginning of the world to the end of the world is that God will have a people for himself in the last Adam and a new generation of people filling the planet in which he will have fellowship with them. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells what? That's our word. I want you to capture that. Because the word righteousness has as its symbolic color code in the book of Revelation, the color what? White. That's the color code in the book of the Revelation. And notice what Peter says. That world will be a world of righteousness. And that's kind of what we're meditating on now, because that is what they are rejoicing in in Revelation 19 with the six. Hallelujah. 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 The marriage supper of the lamb is come and the bride hath made herself ready, literally prepared. What is she prepared for? A world wherein there is nothing but righteousness which would teach us that at present our world is not predominantly or, um, or um, even sufficiently uh, represented by righteousness. Therefore, what we think about our present world as believers is that it is under the curse of sin. It is groaning. It is broken. It is tottering on uh collapse and self-destruction again remember chapter 19 comes after chapter 18 what is 18 about fall of babylon what is 19 about the restoration as a consequence of the bride being what ready 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 and the word that i put up here for you and i to meditate on for a moment is the idea of being prepared and you and i have begun to work that through and here's what we will state as we look at a few more verses. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people by a God with a prepared plan. All right, that makes sense. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people by a God with a prepared plan. We saw this in first, second, uh, first Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. You can pull that up. Remember, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of them uh, those things which God has what? Prepared for them that love him. So there's a preparation motif in the Bible that the believer has to constantly kind of shape his life or her life around. And the question you and why I want to meditate now on, are you preparing for that day? Because what the celebratory final note in Revelation 9 Seven part C is she has made herself what prepared same word prepared she's ready and the, the warning that you and I got in scripture is be ready because you don't know when our Lord is coming Luke chapter 12 now remember what happened in the beginning of Christ's ministry we're going to look at three points around preparation as we lead into this uh, glorious display of, of a bride in her splendor and her honor the display of it. Remember how the Gospels open up Matthew chapter 3, Mark chapter 1, Luke chapter 3 as well. Jesus sends a forerunner before him. It's his cousin. His cousin's name is who? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. You remember how John talked? Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. Watch what John says. We're going to use this and lift this up as a kind of trumpet for you and me. In Matthew 3, 3, John goes before Jesus out of the mouth of two or three witnesses that every word be established. And, and I can say to you guys that there is a parallelism between that first century ministry of John the Apostle, John the Baptist and Jesus and the time in which we're living. If the book of Revelation is becoming concrete to you in terms of the political conditions, social conditions and the dynamics between Rome and national Israel, if you can kind of see the, uh, the nature of the political and social construct, then you can see the parallels between then and now. Instability, uh, carnality, avarice, greed, wealth, prominence, 
at the same time, uh, wars and w rumors of wars and, and coups and treasons and all kinds of things were going on then as they are now, which means the ministry of the gospel that was taking place in John's day and Christ's day was not a ministry that was taking place in a vacuum where everybody was happy. They were in the same kind of situation you and I are in. This is why I say that when you understand the horsemen of the apocalypse, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, they're not riding sequentially one after the other. They're riding simultaneously. The white horse of the gospel is going forth at the same time the red horse of war is going forth. But of course, the black horse of famine is only happening because of the red horse of war. The so men are always at war. They've turned their plowshares and pruning hooks into swords and spears. Somewhere on the planet, people are fighting all the time. And so famine takes place in death. And, and death has become such a norm for us that it's not even funny. And, and in fact, this is a weird thing. I'm going to try to spend time talking about this on Sunday. I know it's a, I know it's a challenge, but I, 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 the thing that I want as we close out Revelation 18 is I want us to get an epiphany on how God sees a, a privileged people who collapse into paganism in such a way that we don't value life. That's what I want us to capture because I, I got a feeling that Americans don't really see themselves collectively as a whole for what we really are. And the, and the Babylonian motif that we're working through in Revelation chapter 18, I believe, is an adequate representation of our whole world in many areas. But there's an area in there that I want to focus on. And that's that area that I closed on last week, last Sunday. Remember, I talked about slaves and the souls of men. Do you guys remember that? Slaves and the souls of men. I'm going to pick up on that on Sunday as we trail out under the imperative rejoice apostles, because I want to talk to you guys about the dimensions of slavery that's taking place and the dimensions of the captivity of the souls of men that are taking place in our world, too, that I don't think we're seeing. I don't think we are gathering that one of the reasons why God will intervene in our world is because he sees the travesty of the souls of men, men being slaughtered at levels that are beyond our recognition and the captivity and, and, and demonic control that's in, capture, in capturing uh, humanity uh, across the globe. I want to talk about that because of what I see, see coming. And I want us to be able to see it too. Why do I want us to be able to see it? Because I want us to be able to understand the urgency of being prepared uh, in a fashion that would help us uh, stifle any kind of inadvertent uh, neglect or uh, support of a culture of death. All right. So when our sinful nature is is um, is is cultivated, what we become is hardened to things that we should be sensitive to, as you know, and and because we're hardened to it. Basically, we end up giving praise to the wicked. And, and, and as believers, we don't want to do that. And so I want us to be, actually pick up on what's going on in, in that context. And so what we've, what we've got here in, in Matthew chapter 3 is John the Baptist sees something that nobody else sees. You know what he sees? He sees the, com the coming of his cousin. He grew up in a household where he heard the gospel from his father, who was a priest, who was deeply knowledgeable of, Zechariah was deeply knowledgeable of the will of God, and his mama Elizabeth was too. And, 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 and so John grew up richly aware of the Torah, the Tanakh, and the prophecies, and he knew he was called to the priesthood, but he also was called to be an anti-priest because of the corruption of the priestly system. John was called to be a priest, and that was not something that you had the right to opt out of. But John never went to the temple. He never did his priesthood. John never did ministry in the temple, as you know. So John became this omen that God uses to let Israel know, and they couldn't pick it up, that Zechariah's boy should be serving in course too, just like everybody else. That's what the Levites were supposed to do, serve in the temple. 
But you see what the people were doing is that they were thinking that they were cool because the service of the temple was taking place. Right. They were operating out of a form of godliness under the assumption as long as the temple is there, then we know God is with us. You know, that's the notion they were holding. This is why Jesus had to say at the end of his ministry, when the apostles were, the, the disciples were all excited about the temple. And Jesus said, are you missing it, fellas? These stones are coming down. They had no idea. They had no idea. They weren't that ready. They weren't that ready. John was. Right. So when you hear John's preaching, John's preaching was about the imminent coming of the Lord's day, bringing doom and damnation upon his own people. Remember, he says he's coming to baptize. He's coming to purge his floor. He's coming to separate the chaff from the wheat. That's how John talked. That's because he could see it happening in a few years when the average uh, Jew couldn't believe it at all because they were wrapped up in the political prosperity that was happening in the Roman Empire. So they thought John was crazy. Here's what John is doing. John's going, as he speaks, speaks as a representative of Isaiah, saying the voice of one crying in the, what's the language? Wilderness. Now that's a spiritual assessment of the character of the people to whom he's preaching. National Israel. Now, what does he say? Prepare. That's our word. Prepare. Now, notice this. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now, that's amazing. Now, he starts preaching about a year before Jesus shows up. And his primary message was prepare. The king is on his way in. And the language of prepare here is the idea of go out onto the roads where the common people traverse and clean the roads up, get the rocks off the road, get the debris off the road, clear out trees, clear out limbs, get everything off the road and smooth the road. Prepare for the coming of the king. Make his path straight. Don't give the king any reason to stumble or go another way. When he begins to come down your avenue, make it known by your preparation of the road that you're ready for him. Now, you guys do know that's the way kings operate. They send a, an advanced crew out to not only make sure that there are no snipers, no enemies, anything, clear all that out, and then make the road smooth so that the king's journey is smooth. And that's the idea here of preparing. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now, can I ask you the question? What is the metaphor of the road? What is the analogy? What is it striking? What is its ultimate objective? What does it point to? The heart. The heart. The heart becomes the pathway or road or access by which the king enters into the city of your soul, of my soul. Isn't it so that Christ coming to us is not coming physically first, but spiritually? Isn't it so that his coming is in the heart, in the mind, in the soul? All right, of course, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the heart is prepared for the interest of the king. I love the way the psalmist puts it. I'm just going to go ahead on and do this. Psalm 24. I want you to hear it. Hear how David lays it out. I want you to hear this is the idea of the preparation. The psalmist lays it out this way in Psalm 24. I'm just going to read uh, a few verses there in order to drive home the point of preparation. I'm pretty sure. This is it. Um, sorry. Psalm 27. Go to Psalm. No, not Psalm 27. It's been a minute. Let me. Oh, no. Psalm 24. Here it is. I'm going to start in Psalm 27. Uh, I'm going to start at verse seven. Lis listen to the language. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. And what? The king of glory shall come in. It's the idea of rolling up the front gates to the city. Roll up the gates. Let the king in. Roll up the gates. Let the king in. Look at verse 8. Who is this king of glory? 
The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Verse 9. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. It's the idea of preparing for the King to come. And then when he comes, make a way for him to enter into the city without any kind of hindrance. Well, that's the idea that John is also laying out for us in Matthew 3. Let's read the rest of the verses there before we go on Matthew 3, verse 4, with regards to preparation. And may we all uh, be able to take this, uh, this admonition and use it as a kind of personal uh, exhortation to make sure that what's going on in our own heart is that we are preparing the way for the Lord. And the same John had raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loin, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Now watch this. In his preaching and telling people to prepare the way of the Lord, how did they respond? Verse 5. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. Now how is it that all these people are coming out to the wilderness? They're being called. See, that's Revelation chapter 18. And the call came and the call came. Come out of her, my people. Come out of her. So uh, all pastors, all preachers, all young men aspiring to the ministry have looked at this model and would hope that God would be so pleased to allow their preaching to draw men and women out to come to Christ through such a proclamation. Because here's what we know. The only way that people will move from point A to point B under the preaching of the gospel is if the spirit of God does it. Men and women will not move an inch if God doesn't empower them to come. They just won't move. And so what we see with John is remarkable. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. And they were what? Baptized. That's even more Phenomenal, because watch this. Some of you already know this. Jews don't get baptized. That's a Gentile ceremony. That's an act that was done for the proselyte who was brought into Judaism under Torah's bar mitzvah, as, uh, bar mitzvah, Th that was not something that was done for a Jew. A Jew, mills were what? Circumcised at eight days. So John is actually calling Jewish people Gentiles. He's preaching to them saying, you are so filthy, so unclean. You are so separate from Torah, so impure. And this is where we're going to have the juxtaposition between this baptism here for the unclean. And she hath made herself what? Prepared. This is the juxtaposition between the two. Because we start off unclean and we end up prepared. You guys got that? That's the trajectory of sanctification for people that are serious about God. All right. We are prepared in Christ, but it's also a process and development in our lives, obviously, as we learned on Saturday uh, with the men. And so we see here and they were baptized in Jordan doing what? Confessing their sins. And this sure enough ticked off the Pharisees, didn't it? Ticked them off. But when he saw many of the Pharisees. Uh, and Sadducees come to his baptism. He said unto them, oh, generation of vipers. See, John would have never had a big church in, in the 21st century. Oh, generation of vipers, who hath warned you to do what? Flee from the wrath to come. Now, I want you to see that, too. If you're understanding eschatology in a sensitive way, John knew the wrath was hanging over the head of Judaism. He knew it. Who hath warned you to flee? Because see, for them to come to the waters of baptism, they would have to admit that they're guilty, that they're sinners, that imminent judgment is at hand, and they wanted to escape by way of the gospel. And so John says, you guys are hypocrites, you are pretending. And he actually forbids them to do it. And then he explains why he's doing what he's doing. And you guys can read that for yourself. But I just wanted you to see how this idea of preparation played into uh, the principle 
And the next ta- next text that you and I want to see around that is what the Apostle Paul has laid out for us in Second Timothy chapter four. We saw it before, but I want to just uh, draw that home because we looked at First Corinthians chapter two nine that God has prepared some things for us. And yet Paul lays out again the expectation of the believer upon his death, what the attitude of the believer should be as he or she would begin to meet their demise. And what a what an insightful thing to learn, because you may not be there yet. And I may not. Tomorrow, I've got to bury somebody again. So I'm burying people all the time. And we, you and I get to ask the question now, you know, because we're not there. We're not being called to the rivers of Jordan yet, but it could happen anytime. And the question would be, if God should call me, will I be, what's the word? Prepared. Will I be able to say what the Apostle Paul is about to say here when he explains this reality and expectation that he has, um, he has endured? Let me start back at verse Six. Here's our word for I am now what? See, I'm now ready. And then he described his departure as a sacrifice to God. What a what a what a what what an appropriate mindset for an apostle to be able to see that his death is not what you and I have learned is the strategic failure appearance that God allows when the wicked, the beast kills the witness and silences the witness. The witness is looking at it as an opportunity and sacrifice unto the Lord. The world is looking at it as a defeat of the Christian. Paul is letting the believer know I'm not defeated. I'm not afraid. I'm not fearful. I'm not mad. I'm what? Ready. I and and There's no way for that disposition to be there for Paul if he did not engage himself from the time of his call. Remember the call, the call out, the call to that labor had to bring him to the point where he's prepared. Would you agree with that? All right, because here he is now some 25 years later and he's in the prison and his sentence is laid out. Nero's going to cut his head off and and God has granted him the readiness to face that with a kind of uh, disposition that allows him to write to Timothy and tell Timothy, I'm ready, man. And the time of my departure is at hand. There's an insight there that allows us also to know that Paul does not view himself as somehow getting off on a pardon or extending his stay. He's going. What a preparation. What a preparation. I am ready to be offered up the time of my departure at hand. Here's what he does now in verse seven, which is where I want to drive home this part for you. Have made herself what? Right. You know what he says? He says he what? He fought. He said he ran. He endured. He did everything in order that making herself ready was a fair assessment of what the believer is engaged in down here. He says, for I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have what? Kept the faith. Now that's important. Because what he's saying is the same faith was that was given to me by grace at my conversion, Acts 9, is with me now 25 years later in the prison in Rome as I'm about to face my beheading. Face my beheading. And and, and, and what is this idea of him being ready now? It means that he has finished his course. What is his course? He did what God had called him to do. He engaged in the ministry that God had called him to do. And this is probably the most ethical element that I want to get across to us. And those of you who are watching that every day that you and I live, we're not here to just simply acquire material wealth or to position ourselves to live good in this world. But we're here on purpose. We've got a role. Yeah, I was I was thanking God for coming over today in preparation for what we do because my wife gave me a sign. I went home after um, doing some labor here at the church because I'm the church. I'm one of the church rats. I played ball. A couple of us know what it means to be a gym rat. I was a baller, right? So in the gym, you just in the gym all the time, right? If if you could, you could sleep in the gym because I just love playing ball. Well, I'm a church rat. I've been a church rat since I've been saved. 
because I didn't grow up in the church. So I love the church. I'm a church rat, right? So I, I'm, I'm cleaning up. I'm doing this. I'm doing everything. Glad. Get home. So I talk to my wife. I'm going to crash for a minute. Let my brain go down so I can reboot so I can be ready for the saints. She wakes me up in the middle of a 35 minute nap. You know, uh, when she knocks, I have to answer. Uh, and she said, I got an assignment for you. And uh, she told me that it was assignment to, to take a food package to one of our families that are sick on my way to church. So because that's what the saints do. What the saints do is when we find out that people are in need, we do care packages. That's just what we do. And I thought to myself, I'm so glad that I'm part of grace because we got women who really care about people like that. Like they don't wait for me to tell them to do it or leadership. They just do it. So my wife fixed a big old uh, bowl of soup and some other accoutrements that I was nosy about, but I, I kept myself. <laughs> Y'all know how I am with food. So I, I didn't even look in the bag. I just took it like a soldier, drove up to the house, didn't even know who they were. I knew they were members, but we have so many members. I, I, who are the Matthews? Knock on the door. Lo and behold, it's a new family that's been coming to Grace for a while. And uh, I probably only talked to them once or twice, but the ladies knew about it. And this, the mama is about to have a baby here in a few days. Um, right along with my daughter, Rachel, they about to have babies here in a minute. And uh, they were surprised to have the saints come and knocking on the door, giving them some food, take care of her, her husband and little son. Right. That's what the saints do. Why? Because we're not just here to acquire wealth and do what we want to do. We're here to make the bride ready. See, because the readiness of the bride is the collaboration of the whole body edifying one another in love. Do you understand what I mean by that? Now, so that becomes a paradigm for that family. So when they're healthy and they hear about others, they'll be motivated. You know what? I was I was sick and ill. And the next thing I know, I had a blessing at the door, a big old package of food. And out of all the people in the church, guess who show up? Pastor. Right. That had to be edifying. Now, I would have never done that because I, I got my routine. But my wife sent me on a mission. And I want to be able to do that till I die. Well, we have situations where people are on their deathbed and the saints meet them. We, I got to be with the saints tomorrow. We got to grieve and whine and cry for one of the saints that are passing away. This is what we do from the conception of the child in the womb to the celebration of the birth of the child to the families working with little children to the encouraging of the young people to, you know, find their gifts and employ their gifts in the ministry of the gospel to young people being committed to the task of the gospel, either getting married and engaging in growing the family or getting involved in businesses that allow the gospel to go for the tears are all the way up to one day Jesus coming back. This is the work we do until Christ comes back. This is what I'm getting at with you, just in case you forget that he saved you on purpose. He saved you on purpose. Life is not about you sitting and waiting for God to uh, just give you something. It's, he's calling you to educate you in order to, in, to equip you in order to employ you. That's what sanctification is about. Sanctification is you get set aside, you get equipped, and then you get employed. You get called out, equipped, employed. And, and, and once we kind of all know our gifts, then life is a life filled with purpose. Would you agree with that? Filled with purpose. And it makes us feel good to be able to, to be employed. So I was so glad to be able to um, like fill in and be just a messenger boy for the ladies on this regard. And this is what the Apostle Paul is saying, because now he can't do any of that anymore. He, he, he's stuck. He's in prison. He's getting ready to wind it down. And that can be an analogy as well of, um, of at a certain point in time when you and I get sick for that final time, we're in prison. Right. We getting ready to get on that train, getting ready to get on down the road. We might have a few days. In fact, my message tomorrow is about a dad who's uh, he passed away two weeks ago, 99 years old. That brother lived a long time know him very distinguished gentleman and I, I was privileged to get to a time to enjoy him i've been in i've been knowing him for probably about seven to ten years 
Uh, his, his daughter will probably tell me it's more, you know, you get older, you kind of contract the numbers, but have enjoyed him imminently. And so tomorrow I get a chance to talk about the blessing of what you guys already know is the slow descent of the airplane in its landing. I've already talked to you about that. Y'all understand what I mean by that, right? The blessing of the slow landing, right? Here you are entering into the tarmac for your destination. God sometimes allow us to have that. Paul is getting that right now. His destination is at hand and his descent is slow and gradual. What a mercy from God. Because it could be a crash landing. It could be a, a, a taking out abruptly, as you guys know. But if God should grant the true believer an opportunity for that plane to land slowly, can you imagine how many people you get to bless as your plane is slowly landing? Because your heart is ready. You're not quiet, crying and moaning. You're glad that God is giving you days and hours to encourage people, build them up, write to them. Timothy, bring me this. Oh, yeah, Timothy, remember that because he loved Timothy to death. This is how you close out your life with your eyes fixed on the prize for which he uses the language, I am now ready. Look at verse eight. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of what? There it is again. See that word righteousness? A crown of what we're going to talk about in a minute for just a minute, a white. A white crown. Why? Because in the book of Revelation, the color code for righteousness is what? I just want you to get that. The color code for righteousness is white. And I'm going to give you an insight into that word here in a moment because we just got a few minutes with it. So I don't want you to be stuck on the the pigmentation of white. I want you to understand its connotation is that of being free of sin, absent of sin, absent of decay, absent of anything that does not conform to God's law. In this sense, righteousness is the idea of full and total and perfect conformity to God's law without variation in such a way that the person who is viewed righteous is now made compatible for the presence of God. Y'all got that? And this is what we meant when we were with Peter. He says, wherein the heavens and the earth that will be made is a heavens and an earth wherein what dwells? Righteousness. That's the way Revelation 21, verse 2 and 3 lays itself out. Go back there again. Revelation 21, verse 2 and 3. And I want to make a statement about Revelation chapter 19, 7, and then we'll get prepared for... Um, our prayer time tonight. So if, if I were to call your attention to the struggle, which we did before, by the time you get to Revelation 21, verse 1, 2, and 3, which the whole thing is just going to be a beautiful study, Lord willing, in the new year, because we're in chapter 18. I have to unpack chapter 19 a little bit more tediously in the preaching. In chapter 20, it's just going to be a, a wonderful study around millennial theology and, and, and all of that language. And once we get to chapter 21, we're dealing with the complete epiphany of the new Jerusalem in all of its splendor. I mean, that that's probably going to be like February or March. And I'm just praying that we're all healthy enough to be ready to absorb that study because you don't hear that kind of preaching and teaching. You don't hear the exegesis and exposition of the new Jerusalem. You only hear cursory commentary about it like you barely have any theological books that go into detail about the new jerusalem right so one of the things i warn us about is when you listen to preaching and teaching if they don't engage the text be warned it's one thing to make a comment on the text it's another thing to expound the text anybody can make a comment on the text and then begin to build ideas about what the text means it's another thing to actually grapple with the text, unpack the text, reveal the context, explain the terminology so you get an inside view of the infrastructure and then the superstructure and its aim and scope and goal symbolically and redemptively, which is what we what we want with that in order to be blessed. I want to see Jerusalem for all every inch of that real estate. I want to know every detail about it. I want to be able to be able to have on record that we have dealt with every line in chapter 21, every part, every every article, every gem, every jewel, every facet of it, as much as the spirit of God will grant us 
Well, here's what I want you to look at in verse one, two and three, because this is the language of the city woman, the city woman. Remember the harlot city and then the city woman. This is the woman in Revelation 12 that has made herself uh, to escape the dragon. And she's in the wilderness where God has a place what prepared for her. So the woman in the wilderness is in a prepared place, being nurtured, being nourished, being prepared for this event. She emerges again after all that struggle right here. Notice what it says. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from where? Right. Coming down from God out of heaven. What's the next word? Prepared. There it is. There it is. Prepared. This sister prepared. So it's really what's interesting here is if we if we understand the fourth blessing to be called up and we are calling this by inference, the rapture. And this is what I am asserting. First, there's a gospel call. There's a call out. There's a call unto. And then finally a call up. Right. We're looking for that call. Right? Like the final uh, event of human history in terms of the ultimate purpose of Christ's return and dealing with humanity and judgment and then restoration and renewal uh, will only occur when the body of believers are what? Raptured. That is the that is the next mystery event that's coming down. This is 1 Corinthians 15. Don't have time today. We'd love to do it. We'd love to sit right here and work through that. But I'm going to try to do that when we get to chapter 20 and do it on the millennial language, if you guys don't mind waiting on that. But the idea is that 1 Corinthians 15 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, the trump will sound. And then it begins to use that language. It's the same idea that's used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 17. The Lord will descend with the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we who remain will be caught up together in the air. So shall we forever be with the Lord. That is that final consummation language that we're reading in Revelation 19, verse 7 and 8. The bride hath made herself ready. Blessed is everyone that's called to the wedding feast. Right, see, and that, the, the way I'm sharing it with you, in heaven, it was much louder than that. I mean, like, they so super, they don't in heaven. That place is ringing. Everybody just blasts. Why? Because the struggle has actually been met by a decisive intervention of Christ to destroy the whore and the Babylonian system. See, and, and if we don't keep that juxtaposition there, we won't understand why are they celebrating like they're celebrating. Why are they celebrating like they celebrate? Because the whore, the beast, is so arrogant and pompous in his agenda to take God's place and to destroy God's saints and to destroy humanity. His his avarice and greed, his pomp, his 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 plans are so magnificent that they deceive the whole world. And this is so really weird because this is kind of where we are in the trajectory of history. This is kind of where we are in the trajectory of history. The information now that you and I are sitting on and the access to the plans and the estimations and the goals and the agenda, the, the whole new uh, I mean, extremely lofty ideas that are out there about the, the next dimension are so absolutely beyond credulity that if the man or the woman that hears about these plans and, and investigates them deeply enough doesn't have roots in God so deep, they will easily be disjointed from biblical faith. Easily disjointed from biblical faith because of the allure and the magnitude and the dimensions of the whore and the beast system in its agenda and its threat to anyone that would even dare rise up against it. You guys understand what I'm saying? Because you and I are living on the brink of that new age. 
It's amazing because the new age is really an anti-gospel disposition on the part of the wicked. They're calling it a new age, and they've been doing this since the 30s and the 40s. You know that, right? The age of Aquarius. This is what is supposed to be coming in. And the idea of Aquarius is a new world, right? Where the water comes in and washes away the old and reestablishes a new, right? How arrogant is the enemy that he would take biblical concepts and distort them, excising Christ from it, redemption and, and, and sin and, and God's sacrifice of giving his son. See, because you know what he's doing. He's telling humanity you're not a sinner. He's telling humanity your problem is not sin. Your problem is not internal ruin. Your problem is that there's a bad management economically going on, sociologically going on. What's The problem with the world is not you, it's it. The problem with the world is that we are in old paradigms that don't work anymore. We got to change these paradigms, including getting rid of religion, getting rid of God. Y'all know that. So, all right, that's what's coming. I mean, and it's getting ready to come in such a way that if the believer is not fixed in his understanding of God, and if he doesn't have the epiphany of Christ's glory that allows him to maintain his allegiance to God, it's going to be easy to roll with the Babylonian system. Slaves and souls of men. This is what I'm going to exercise your thoughts on a bit on Sunday and show you the categories that are forthcoming with that slaves and souls of men because that's how they do it. The, the goal is to actually create a populace by stealing them. But look at the wicked. I'm done right here. Now watch how the wicked. This is how crazy the wicked is. This is how crazy. The devil can't have no children. He can't produce one child. The demons can't populate. They can't procreate. Please hear me now. Genesis chapter 6, the giants in Genesis 6, the Nephilim, are not a hybrid of humans and, and demons. That's pagan mythology. No sperm, no semen in angels or demons. You guys understand that? They can't repopulate. All they can do is steal. So God populates and the devil steals them. How do we know that? That was the first strategic Assault on the part of the devil to steal Adam and Eve. Why? Because he can't go out and create his own. He can't go out and populate his own society. Are you guys hearing me? I'm just kind of giving you a little caveat so you can understand. We know his works. His works is to take what God has created and steal it. And then inseminate what God has created with his own doctrine, his own ideology. But his goal is to incarnate mankind with his demonic mind so that through his demonic mind, he can recreate people in his own image via technology and via humanity. Do you understand what I just stated? That is the antichrist system forthcoming. And when he can get human beings to hate themselves, this is good. What I'm sharing with you is good. His goal is to get human beings to hate themselves. His goal is to get human beings to despise being human. See, because the antithesis of hating yourself is loving yourself. The antithesis of despising yourself is to see yourself and view yourself in honor. The antithesis of abhorring yourself and hurting yourself is the antithesis of recognizing that you are created in the Imago Dei and that you have a relationship with the true and the living God and that you are an eternal creature operating at the highest level of creative order and that you are made to exist forever. And that your goal is an escalation into a glorious state with God. Now, if you and I know that that's the case, then we're not going to adopt policies of death, are we? We're not going to kill our children in the womb. We're not going to kill our babies out of the womb. We're not going to engage in any kind of killing. We're not going to kill men because we want to be women. We're not going to kill women because we want to be men. We're not going to kill the Imago Dei in the man and the woman in order to be a transhuman. 
which is where we're going. You do understand that. I've been telling you that for a minute now. The trans is the next move. So funny, just a year ago, all these silly hypocrites were talking about Black Lives Matter. They have disappeared now. Hypocrites. All they did was marshal a bunch of ignorant folk to go vote. Now they're not even a conversation. Because remember what I told you? The whole thing is to move the man and the woman out of the way to raise up the trans. And that's what this equity doctrine is all about. The Equality Act is about this next level of getting us to think in terms of third categories. You got that? Third categories. That's the battle forthcoming. The only reason we would overcome that third category uh, doctrine is if we love the fact that God loves us. If God loves us because we're created in the Imago Dei, then we're going to engage in acts that reflect that love. You hear what I just stated? That means we're going to sacrifice and we're going to fight and we're going to stand and we're going to debate and we're going to demonstrate the reality of God's dignity and standard given to mankind. First, freedom, autonomy, to the right to self-destiny. You don't get to make me a slave. I'm not your slave. I'm God's slave, as are all men. My mind is mine. You don't get to take my mind and do whatever you want to with it, because that's what's coming down the pike in a minute. So you can see how Christian doctrine is the only real doctrine in the world that is already formulated to oppose that system. You guys got that? But the heart has to be committed to an understanding that there is a God that has dignified us with that mission that gives us a right to oppose the system that basically is thinking that it can take us like slaves and do whatever it wants to do with us. Us and our children. That's a worthy fight to engage in, saints. In fact, that fight is probably going to be the fight that makes us prepared for the coming of Christ. The bride that made herself. Remember, chapter 19 comes after chapter 18, where the whore has a cup where she didn't kill a bunch of us. And then Jesus shows up and abruptly puts an end to it. And he tells the saints, rejoice. That's what we're going to pick up on Sunday. Y'all rejoice, rejoice. She thought she had you. And then all of a sudden, when the smoke clears, here comes this beautiful bride coming down boom just the universe is just lit up with the glory so on friday we're gonna unpack psalm 45 and look at that